With this being the second uh, audiobook that we've done together, how did you find the process this time of turning the work into an audiobook? Well, much easier because I knew you and I knew <laughs> <laughs> it, was, uh, it was just very straightforward. Are you ready to embark on this extraordinary journey towards financial freedom? Let the audio that follows be your guide, offering insights, guidance and encouragement as we navigate the path to reclaiming control over your financial destiny. Remember, with the right mindset, determination and a roadmap to success, achieving financial freedom is well within your grasp. Hassan Afifi, remind me of where you are. I'm in London. Whereabouts in London are you? I'm in West London. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm about 30 miles up the road in Hitchin. Okay. So, uh, so I get into London uh, whenever I can. It's, uh, it's only 35 minutes on the train, so it's, uh, we're, we're really quite close. It's weird. If you live north of London... You can live further away and it's quicker to get in than if you live south. And it's because, let me get this straight, it's a bit nerdy. The trains north of London have overhead cables. Right. And the trains south of London have the third rail. And the trains on the third rail are a lower voltage and they don't run as fast. Ah, okay. So if I, if I lived 30 miles into Kent, it would take me longer to get into central London than living in Hertfordshire where I live being north because right. we've got we've got higher voltage trains the, the strange thing is that the, the modern ones now are actually dual voltage and they switch from the overhead cable to the third rail at around Blackfriars and then they go out all the way on onto Brighton but um, right. that's way more information that you wanted when you told me you're in West London I know that okay <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about Latecomer's Guide to Financial Freedom. This is the yeah. second book we've done. We've, it's the second book I've worked with you on turning it into an yeah. audio book. Obviously, you've written many books. Let's just get a bit of background on you for anyone who didn't watch the last one of these interviews we did. What sure. qualifies you to give financial advice specifically on financial freedom? Right. Um, a couple of things. Uh, the first thing is the... Um, my like professional qualifications and my career and the second thing is my experience so from a professional point of view um, i have a degree in economics with a focus on investments and business planning um, and i've been working as an investment advisor to uh, some of the largest institutions in the world for well, over nearly 30 years now um, well, no, 28, maybe. And then, um, and then I moved on from the institutional side of things to recently uh, into uh, wealth management, which is advising individuals on their uh, wealth. Although I work with what is called an ultra high net worth investors, uh, that I still, the, the, the theory is still the same uh, for for normal people as well as the ultra high net worth ones um, from an experience point of view apart from my professional career um, I have um, as as we've discussed this before like I've gone through uh, the highs and lows of uh, of the financial cycle so I achieved my so-called financial freedom uh, before I reached 30 um and it was a great time because i didn't have to work for money anymore and i was doing a, a charity project and that went completely wrong and i lost all the money that i made and more and i had to start over in my mid 40s from in debt uh, with no money nothing to fall back onto at all and starting over completely and building that back up to uh, where I am today. I'm not yet financially free completely because I'm not that old, but um, but it's it's just that journey. I, I was thinking to myself along the line all the time was, I should have known this from the start. And if if I know this, I have to tell other people how to do it 
because there is no point in me knowing it and not sharing it. That's that's really it. I, I, I've gone through many years of very, very difficult, very tough time uh, financially, and it, and it put a lot of pressure on family, on relationships, and all of these things. And along the way, I was really maybe a part of of or sometimes the the relationships become a little bit strained because of my way of looking at things which is basically every failure that i go through i take it as a lesson and not and and try to move on from there rather than try to do something different let's say so uh so that that's that's why like when when i've gone through the process of trying to get myself out of debt trying to rebuild everything from scratch trying to find jobs when i'm in my, my mid 40s uh trying to start completely from zero i didn't have any savings i didn't have i was in debt i didn't have any the pension was completely wiped out all of these things and i have to start completely from zero i i was renting i didn't have my own house and all of these different bits and pieces and having to build that back up and i was thinking every single time i was getting over a certain hurdle i was thinking i really would like to help someone else if they are in a similar situation that there is hope at the end of this and and it's it's very it's not easy but it's simple the 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 simplicity of it is that there are certain things like if you want to lose weight you have to eat less right but it's not easy to do that because I no, it's crave. simple but not easy <laughs> exactly <laughs> i crave food i i love food but i so i cannot stop eating i know what i need to do so the the decisions when it comes to financial parts part as well is is very simple it's it's very simple in terms of that once you plan it and you know what to do, it's it becomes very difficult to start and to actually have the discipline to to go through with it. And this is really where a lot of books, I think, and a lot of people who speak, they always speak to people who are very young or they don't have much of a responsibility or they have many years in advance. And I was thinking, if I am in my 40s or 50s, I really, and, and I am in debt, I have nothing to fall back onto. And, and I am thinking, if, if I'm thinking outside of the way that I thought, like most people would, they would think I just have to work until I die because there is no other way, right? I cannot um, come out of the the uh, debt hole i cannot save enough to keep me comfortable in retirement i can never retire and all of these things all of these questions come to mind when someone are at an advanced age or near retirement age and they cannot see a way out of where they are and this is so, this is so, basically so this, this why, book yeah. basically gives tremendous hope to people who think they've left it too late by the time they get to their 40s or 50s you're really living hope, proof that it's not too late i would really hope so i would really really hope so because um it's it's also it's a very short book i i i again i intended not to make it very big or or comprehensive or sophisticated i intended to make it as simple and as straightforward as possible so that anyone without any financial education, without any education at all, if they can read and have a calculator and have internet access, they can do whatever it is that it's in this book. Obviously, some situations are more complex and more complicated than others, uh, but the, the fundamentals remain the same. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of like the, the planning part of things is almost exactly the same. It's just that you have to prioritize certain things. You have to uh, put things ahead of others um, and working out the numbers. And 
if the numbers don't make sense, you have to make them make sense. And, and that's really where the difficulty, the main difficulty becomes. This is where if someone is used to a certain standard of living or they have been living in a, in a house, for example, for the past 20 years, and all of a sudden when they put the numbers down on paper, they find that they cannot afford that house that they've been living in for 20 years. And this is really like probably one of the most difficult things. Or you have kids at university and they are asking for, I don't know, three, four hundred pounds over what they're asking for initially. I don't know. They, the dog has to go to the vet. Things like this, you know, like the, the, there are certain elements that, that come up and and you really have to make very tough choices in order to get over that hurdle. And, and this is really the, the biggest difficulty in all of that. So back to your question, what qualifies me <laughs> to, to, to write something like this is because I've been through it as well as my professional uh, background is within that field so i hope that this is this qualifies me a little bit to 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 talk about i this. think that it well and truly qualifies you more than uh, most people who give financial advice i would say to have a personal story as well as the, the qualifications and the experience professionally that you've had i think that more than qualifies you for a book called latecomers guide to financial freedom now the subtitle of the book is empowering your 40s and 50s with debt repayment passive income and retirement security now of those three is it a three-legged stool or is there one that's the one you should tackle first so somebody watching this interview who was in their 40s and 50s and they've got some debt that obviously all debt needs repaying. They've been thinking about passive income and they're also getting to that age when they need to, you know, consider a retirement security. Is is one of those more important than the others? Or? No. Right. So you've got to get okay, them all so. right. It's no, it's no good getting one looked after. You've got to get all three down to make yes, this work. Because when you're in debt you have to come out of debt that's that's really the 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 main thing that that will eat you from the inside if you're in mm -hmm. debt and you cannot see any way out of it this is really a massive massive part of it when you're in debt and this is so that that's really a very big psychological hurdle for anybody if if you're in debt a little bit and especially if you cannot see any way out of it that that becomes a a huge burden and I have seen people die from this it's not it's not something that is that is just something to to brush aside right it is so so important to make sure that this is addressed it doesn't have to end now yeah. but it has to be to be addressed because you need a plan it has to be planned. It has to yeah. be planned because if it's not planned and if it just keeps going like the, the, that, that hole gets deeper and deeper. This is a major problem for anyone. So, and for it, instance, if someone's got credit card debt and they're just making the minimum payment, they've got a car loan, but their payment is way in the future and the car's not worth anything like what you owe on it. And maybe your your mortgage is also way into the future. Is this what we're talking about? A debt hole? Yeah, but, the okay, mortgage so not so bad, though, I would have thought, because that is an appreciating asset. Even a car loan is fine because you can still keep the car after you've paid it off and whatever. Yes. That's not really the issue. The issue is becomes with things like credit cards, overdrafts, uh, personal loans these things that that are just accruing interest all the time and if you're making just the minimum payments it's just becoming bigger and bigger problem and right. the issue with this is that most of the time people with such debt they are their expenses are even higher than what they can afford so they are getting deeper into debt and meaning so that monthly to service that debt they're not really making enough money to to service the debt and have some money to live on as well one of the reasons people pay the minimum to pay like for credit cards or loans or whatever is because they cannot afford to pay more than that and sometimes they even get into debt in order to pay off another debt so that that's a vicious cycle that needs to be stopped 
And th there are a lot of ways to get over this, even on a low budget and all of these things, but it has to be addressed because if you don't address it in your mind, it's always going to be, oh, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm getting deeper and deeper into debt. And then you ignore it and, and you live in denial. And, and it's just the problem is becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. And yeah. it leads to certain also the, like the, the, the psychological part is huge. Right. And I have seen it. I always have like a heart rate monitor on. Right. And I can I can tell like when I'm stressed because the average heart rate goes up by like 10 beats per minute, which is huge. Right. It's yeah. uh, so. So it's not just a psychological thing. It's physically you have your heart cannot take it. It's it's so not it's literally bad for your health to, to the and can be fatal. Yeah. As you mentioned earlier, yeah, absolutely, and 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 it doesn't have to be paid off straight away. As I said, it's just that it needs to happen. The first thing is calling the credit card companies, calling the bank, calling whatever. Even even if like everything has to start with pen and paper, write down each and every debt that you have with how much interest, if you don't know it, you have to find out how much interest you're paying on each of these. Because sometimes people, they they just apply for a credit card, they get the credit card, and they don't realize how much they're paying in interest, right? And these interests, they, they, they change as well over time. So they might have taken a credit card three, five years ago, and now the, the interest rate is different on that credit card, but another one that they have it might be a little bit better. So by just writing it down and writing how much interest is paid on each one and what the minimum payments on each of these are, one can can start to develop an idea of the actual picture of the debt that they have. Mm -hmm. And forget about the house and the car. These these are like secondary. But the, yeah. the main ones are the actual debts that have to be repaid. The and personal if not, loans and the credit cards. Yeah. yeah. You've got to get and them under control. One of the ways that, that actually could, but th this is where discipline has to come into it, right? So before one should figure out how to pay off these debts, they need to see their outgoings, all their other outgoings. So that the initial part, like, like the pre, <laughs> like, uh, yeah, uh, the pre-planning, if you like, is the budget. Yeah, right. That's that's really the step zero. You've got to know where the money's going each month. Yeah, if you because and that's the only place you're going to be able to find the extra you need to service the debt is you're going to have to cut back in some areas, absolutely. and so you've got to look out for areas that are out of control. <laughs> absolutely, and and okay. a lot of people say, oh, I I I I I don't have to get my coffee at Starbucks or whatever. That's not really what we're talking about. Right. It's not going to make that big a difference unless you're you're drinking like a hundred coffees a day. <laughs> your your two three pounds a day is not really the end of the world. But when you put it down in writing, like your house, your your utilities, uh, the what you spend on the kids, the clothes, the going out, the if if you invite people over and and you ordering takeouts, uh, all of these things, you, you you know how much you pay on groceries, you know how much you pay on petrol if you have car or transportation, uh, all of these things. You have to really be very honest and objective about the, everything that goes out. So you look at your bank statement or credit card statement, whatever you're paying with, and add all of these up and know exactly how much you're spending every month. And then all of a sudden you are going to find maybe two or three items that are eating up most of these things. And yeah. most of the time it's going to be housing and utilities, yeah. most of the time. But yeah. if, if there is absolutely no choice in changing your where you live or reducing your utility bills or mobile phone bills, again, you can move from one yeah, Operate there are some great it. deals out there on on mobile phones. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I, I've, I change. I used to have contracts for the phone. Now I buy the phone outright, yeah. and I I don't usually buy the latest phone. In fact, this was the, it is the latest, but it's the S, it's the Apple SE, 
and right. and it cost me i think it was 299 pounds for the phone which i've got forever and now mm. I, and i have a deal with sky mobile i pay six pounds a month whereas i right. can remember paying up to 40 pounds a month well, that's, for the that's bloody the handset and the and yeah, the, like, and it's just madness. Yeah, I was I was with one operator for probably the good part of fifteen years, right? And I was just like all the lines, four lines, me, my wife, and two kids, right? And for for all of this time, it was just the same operator. And then I thought, okay, I I I was looking at the like the landline and the Wi-Fi and all of these things. And I found another deal that included the, the, um, the mobile and it saved me 150 pounds a month. Yeah. That's a saving. You're not going to, you're not going to save that. Yeah, like, giving save up that your Starbucks. Exactly. So th this so is that's the stuff to look it. for. That's what you got to look sometimes, for. Sometimes there are certain things that, that you're not really thinking about. Then all of a sudden you find, I didn't know that I was paying, these hundreds of pounds on mobile phones, I, I didn't even know yeah. until I actually, because I was living in denial, right? I was like <laughs> getting into that point where everything is going wrong. So I really didn't want to look at what I was spending, right? It was right. just- the, And previous the to that, you weren't looking because you were probably earning a decent amount of money and you didn't worry about it. And that is a trap that people fall into, isn't oh, it? Before, no, but that, that was at the time when I was interned. Okay. Okay. Right. Yeah. So the, it yeah, was yeah. at the time when when things are going very wrong. I have already stopped working. I've, st I've already stopped earning, and the outgoings were going, and I ran out of all of my everything. Just disappeared. Right. So this yeah. is where like my head was like because it's the easy way out. Initially, you like. If I don't look at it, it doesn't exist. Right? It, it really is <laughs> like the, the, the ostrich principle. <laughs> absolutely, and it's yeah. a that first step is very difficult to actually admit to myself that maybe this is not working. Right? Yeah, this is really not working. I have to make a, a drastic change here. Right? Yeah, and the the. The other thing is for most people in their 40s and 50s who are in similar situations, they're not alone. They might be in a couple and make use of that. You yeah. have already the support there. And, and I found out that big part of disputes were trying not to do things together, trying to do it on my own, okay. by myself and not involving my wife, for example. Right. But once once things become clear, there is the initial shock and initial anger, and then after that, okay, how are we going to work this out? Yeah. Then we can work it out together because again, there is another income in the house. It's not just myself, right? It's uh, so that's that's a very big element in terms of like people cannot do this on their own by themselves if they are in a family they have to involve others in it yeah and i think that for me that was the most difficult part right okay and it is probably if i'm honest it is more about that i felt like i was letting my family down rather than being arrogant so it was a pride thing in in a way, yes, in a way, um, and in some other ways, it was like in the beginning, maybe the issue wasn't as big as it was after a while, and I thought maybe I could fix this, and it never happened. But then, when it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, it because it comes to a point where it's too big now, like mm. it's, uh, and then why didn't you share this from the start and this is really where the problems might begin right it's a, it's a very tough one it's a very mm -hmm. very tough one and i think this is more difficult than anything else forget about the financial part for it it's the 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 family and how they are going to be involved in in this with you that is really key to all of this 
So did you think it was your problem alone and not the family's problem? Yes, because I saw that the, the loss of all the money initially in that charity project that I had on the side was my problem and I made that mistake so it was mine to fix. Right, okay. But it yeah. was affecting everyone around me. It wasn't just yeah. affecting me. Yeah. Right? yeah. It's, uh, I have kids at uni. I have <laughs> like, uh, it, it, it's it's not, it's not something that affects me on my own so i cannot just confront this by myself yes the most like burden it will eventually come back to me to resolve but everybody needs to understand not necessarily the kids but definitely my partner and that's really it's a partnership and it's not just one person living with another and that's it you know it's uh, mm -hmm. So this is, I think this is the toughest bit. That's really the, for, for people, especially when, when you get into debt, this is really like, the, there is all kinds of emotions that get into it so from embarrassment to pride to arrogance to all different things that, that, that come into it. But eventually it has to be resolved as a family and not one person on their own. Because mm -hmm. the changes that will happen, that that need to be ha to happen after that, especially if the debt is big, if the debt is small, like three thousand, five thousand pounds, it can end within a few months. Most of the time, it, it, it should be manageable within a few months, and it's done, and then people move on. But when it's in the tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, that's a very different ball game, right? Because mm. that's a, that's that that will take a massive change on everyone's like the, everyone's lives have to change. Yeah, and it's not just going to be the debt because like the 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 passive income side of things has to be planned into this as well. Because well, you're, well, let, let's you're, talk because we we've covered the debt. I think let's talk yeah. about the passive income then. Where can people find passive income? Right. So when when people are talking about retirement, everybody thinks 67 or 65 or 60 or whatever that age. And, and it's, it's a specific age of retirement and that's it. But most of the time we are not taught at school or at uni or any, any time unless you sit down with a financial advisor and they explain it to you. We're not taught what retirement actually means, right? There is a state pension, there is the pension that you're paying uh, if you're getting a salary that, that goes out, but you have no idea where that money is going or what it does, right? And you don't, most people that I have spoken to, they have no idea also how much they're going to be getting when they retire or when they can retire in the first place. So I always like to think about this backwards, okay? So you start from thinking about what is the amount of money that is going to give you a decent standard of living and 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 that's it really that that's that's mm. the, the the starting point so if today you you have a family and you work out like your housing utilities car transportation two holidays a year uh, something to charity uh, some gifts for christmas and birthdays and all of these things and you work out let's give a random number of fifty thousand pounds a year okay so that's your starting point that's really the 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 the, the main number that you have to focus on you've got to make fifty thousand a year to keep the, to get that lifestyle yeah. that you want yeah so in order for you to make a passive income it means that your investments have to be generating fifty thousand pounds a year with you sleeping at home not doing anything that's mm -hmm. passive right mm -hmm. passive it means that you're not involved you're not doing anything um because i see a lot of stuff on social media as well like um people talking about passive income and then they say Amazon something or drop shipping or all of these things that's not passive you are actually working right right yeah passive it means that you have absolutely no involvement in anything and you're still making the money yeah 
So how does this come to life? You invest the money in investments that are going to be generating that 50,000 pounds every year. Right. Okay. So in general, again, like we're, when, when we're talking about investments, I would like if anyone is listening to this, please do not listen to any of the social media guys who are saying invest today in Tesla or Apple or that specific stock or whatever, because that's not investment. This is not investment. Investment, the actual investment means that you are going to be putting your money in a portfolio of investments that if 10 of them go bust, you haven't lost anything. If one of these companies that people recommend and whatever goes bust and you have all your money in it, you are in big trouble. Yeah. So proper investing means that you are, again, like we've spoken about this before, right? That you are actually becoming a shareholder or a partner in that business. If we're yeah. talking about equities, that I'm investing my money in a company that if Graham is going to be selling computers or phones and he needs the money to buy the stock and make the, the payments on, on the lease for the shop for the first six months or whatever, he needs the investment. So I go and invest my money with Graham and Graham's background of selling mobile phones is great and all of that. And I trust him. And that's how when, when your shop makes the money, you can pay me dividends or uh, a part of the profits that are coming out. You pay me that. And this is my passive income because I'm not involved in the business, but I'm giving you the investment, right? Mm -hmm. And this is the exact same thing when we're investing in any of the big companies, Microsoft, uh, British Petroleum, any, any of these, right? So... But the main thing is that any investment has to be the, the risk management is a key in all of this. And, and in order, it's, it's a very easy thing to manage the risk by investing in an index fund. And an index fund, the index, it means like if, if I want to invest in the U.S., the biggest companies in the United States, because it's the largest economy on Earth at the moment, I can invest in the top 500 or the largest 500 listed companies in the US by following the S&P 500 index. So I find the fund that invests or copies the exact structure of that index of the S&P 500. And I am already invested in 500 largest companies in the US. Mm -hmm. and, and that's it. So and every year, the 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 companies in that index they change where well, they they actually review them every quarter but they change over time so in 1980 the s p 500 looked very different from what it was 10 years ago and it looks very different from what it is today right and it, and it just follows what is happening in the world at the time so maybe in 1980, it was all banks and big conglomerates and uh, maybe some industrial companies. Um, and now it moved to the top 10, probably are mostly tech, uh, Apple, Microsoft, Tesla. So these are the largest companies at the moment. And eventually it will change to other stuff as we go along. But I don't have to worry about any of that. Because if I invest in the S&P 500, I have absolutely no input into what goes on there. I don't have to worry about which companies are the biggest or the smallest or what they, what they do. All of this is irrelevant to me because I am just invested in the largest 500 companies in the US, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. There are some tweaks that can be done if, uh, for example, th there are certain uh, times when people want to only invest in green business or they only want to invest in, um, I don't know, Sharia compliant or th there are certain things like that. But there are funds that invest according to each of these criteria that we don't have to worry about the, the ins and outs of it and everyday investment and what the market is doing and all of these things. Right. So so if I work it backwards, I want to eventually 
I want my investment to make me that fifty thousand pounds that we spoke about. So I will be looking to invest my money in something that will bring me that money. Mm -hmm. On average, the funds that make these returns they like the, either the high dividend yield funds or high yield fixed income funds or fixed income it means that we are investing in bonds so we're buying government bonds or corporate bonds and so on so, so we're very safe yeah yeah so on average if we have a portfolio maybe of two or three funds so one fund that is like high dividend yield maybe uh, companies from the eu and another one from the us another one from asia and maybe another one uh, that is fixed income so again it's not just the one fund that we're investing in maybe three or four of these and i speak a little bit about this in in the book as well yeah and eventually what we're looking at in terms of of the cash payments every year from these are around five to seven percent from our initial investment yeah okay and that's been consistent over time yes over yeah. the past decades it's not yeah. like yeah so so if if we're talking about if we want to make fifty thousand pounds divided by five percent so we need a million pounds right now that that's, sounds like a lot. That's know. a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. That's a lot of money by any standards. But there, yeah. there are a few things that, so at, at the first glance, when you look at this number, you're thinking, well, I'm never going to do this if I'm in debt and I don't have any savings and whatever. But that's, that's just, you bear with me until the end. And this is, this is where we're going to have to break it down how to get to that point, right? And you so do that, cover this in the book, by the way, we should say, yes. if you want to go, if you want to drill down much deeper than the book, Latecomer's Guide to, to Financial Freedom, it's all in there. But yes, yes. Um, so, so, so that million pounds is really, the, that, that's our goal. That's the main thing that we want to achieve, right? And, and the reason why, when you ask me the question about whether it's the debt repayment or the passive income or, or all of these things, which one is, comes first, they all have to be together. Right. And this is where I think sometimes I, I have heard over the years some financial advisors saying, forget about everything. If you are in debt, you pay off your debt first and then you move on to the next step. But from my point of view personally, I could not do that because paying off the debt meant that probably it might have taken me five, ten years. And I don't have five, ten years in me in order to do that right so if if i ignore the investment side of things or the passive income goal i am just never going to achieve this and this is why they have to happen simultaneously they cannot one cannot come before the other because if i start investing and i ignore the debt that's a big problem and if yeah. i start with the debt only and i ignore the investment that's a huge problem later on yeah. So I have to do both together. So in order to work this again backwards, we would look at investments so that the final investment is going to look very different from the initial investment. Okay. So if we have, let's say I'm 50 and I want to retire at 60 or 65. So let's give it 10 years. Okay. So these 10 years is all I have in order to achieve that million pounds. That's a big number. Yes. Okay. So and 10 years it, sounds very short when you say it like that. Yes. Yes. Because in order to build a million pounds in 10 years, if, if especially if, if what's coming in is exactly or less than what's going out, that's a big problem. Yeah. Right. So we start off by doing a couple of things. The first thing is you have to look at what your state pension is. Okay, so if you go on the government website and try to find the state pension, you will enter your login. If you don't have a login like the, the government uh, gateway ID, you create one, you go in there, you enter your national insurance number and all of that. And then it will give you exactly how much you are going to be getting. Oddly enough, they do it like a weekly payment, but you can okay. work out times 52 and how much you're going to be getting per year yeah so and this is the first number that you look at 
and deduct that from the 50,000. Right, right. So let's say that you're going to be getting, I don't know, let, let's say it's, um, I'll, I'll work out the numbers when I'm with you. So let, let's just say it's 700 pounds a month. Yeah. Okay. And so that means it's 8,400 pounds a year and take that out from the 50,000. So you're left out with 41,600 pounds a year that you need to make. Yeah. To make. Through, through okay? Because you already have the state pension. Yeah. Okay. The second thing you can do is that you have to find out if you have any pension accounts anywhere. From employers, maybe. Yeah. So previous employments, every time, so over the past maybe 10, 15 years, it, no, um, when did it start, the mandatory stuff? It was about 2015, I would say, 2015, yeah. 2016. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. 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 Um, that, that employers had to pay into a pension. Okay. So, but before that, if you were employed by any company, maybe you have already have a pension. Mm -hmm. So this might be if, if one changed their job, maybe five, six times over the years, because they're in, in their forties or fifties, it is very likely that they have changed a few times. Mm -hmm. And because if they haven't, normally people who don't change their jobs, they don't end up financially broke right mm -hmm. yes. it usually comes up when because i i have changed many times as well so i know that again from experience but in any case look back and see if there was any pension that was paid to you like any pension account that you have with any of your previous employers you might have to contact them you might have to find the find old pay slips First of all, to see if there was anything deducted for pension from your pay slips. If yeah. there was something like that, then you have a pension account somewhere. Yeah. And that might be bigger than you, you think. It might be in the tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands. If, you're, if you've been working for 25 or 30 years, it might be a very big pot that yeah. you were not aware of. Yeah. So this is, this is a very important part that, that needs to be addressed that yeah. you really have to make sure that you you know where your pension accounts are. Yeah. What can be done is that you can consolidate all of these into one account after that. Yeah. So it's you can consolidate it into what is called a self-invested pe personal pension or a SIP. So you can open that SIP account and just consolidate all of these old accounts into that. And you don't have to do anything other than just know the existence of that account, who the account is with, and the account number you give it to the SIP provider and they do the rest. They they bring over all the the money or the investments or whatever it is that, that was there into your new account. So this way you have everything in front of you in one place and you don't have to be distracted by having to remember 10 different logins, right? Yeah. So this is another thing. Another the third thing that needs to be done is that if you have a partner you have to un to involve them in this because the 50,000 is all of a sudden, especially if, if you're earning the same or similar salaries or even, even if the salaries are different, they are earning more than you or you more than them. It doesn't matter. That 50,000 all of a sudden or the 41,600, if they are getting the state pension, you can deduct that again. So yeah. that's another 8,000. If, if we're assuming the 700 pounds a month for them yeah. as well, which is yeah. again like it's not you can get up to 900 and something a month i believe uh, yeah. state pension but anyway so that's that's another 8400 so if we take that out that's 33200 that you're looking to make right okay yeah now and you'll still get 50000 but you only need to make that much cuz cuz you already yes. got the other coming in every exactly. month from the state pension and from maybe some employee pension yeah. yes but yeah. the, the 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 previous pensions that might actually take out it take out quite a bit from what you need to be making because you already have that in yeah. the yeah as a head start yeah yes. yeah the, yeah as the the lump sum that it's going to be that the and um, the same goes the same goes with your partner yeah. So you look at their pensions as well and see where they are with their pension accounts. 
So, yeah. for example, th this becomes a little bit more complicated with my wife, for example, because she's a teacher and she has a teacher's pension. So it's a very different, different way of of looking at a pension. It's it, you, you're not a hundred percent sure what it's invested in or whatever, but it tells you if you retire at sixty-seven, this is what you're going to be getting, and if you retire earlier, the, and all of these things. But you can work out, like let's say that there. If, if, for example, that teacher's pension is going to be make, let's just put a random number of ten thousand pounds a year, right? Yeah, yeah. So we we are down now to twenty two twenty three thousand two hundred pounds yeah. that we actually want to make. That's that's like okay. So now the twenty three thousand two hundred is the goal, right? Yes. So in order to make that 23,200 pounds, what we need in the pension pot is 464,000 pounds. So that's a lot easier to make over 10 years than a million. <laughs> it's still it's still not easy. It's a stretch. It's a stretch, yeah. sure. Yeah, okay. and it's going to take so, discipline, yes. So that 464,000, we're, we're going to work out how we're going to get towards that as well. Like it, it needs to be done step by step, right? Yeah, yeah. So the 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 first thing that we need to do is open that SIP, the yeah. self-invested uh, personal pension. The SIP yeah. account is key because for, let's assume that we are a basic rate taxpayer, right? Yeah. Just 20%. we're paying the basic rate. Yeah. We're not going to be in the higher brackets and all of these things, just the basic rate. So yeah. the basic rate is 20%. Yeah. So it means that for, for the SIP, the government refunds that tax. Okay. Right. okay. Yeah, so tax if I right. want to invest, for example, let's say that I all of a sudden, I don't know, I inherited some money or I got a gift from my parents. Okay, whatever it is, or I sold the house and I want to achieve that 464,000 pounds immediately. Yeah. What I would need to do in order for me to achieve this, well, obviously there are limits as to how much you can put in a SIP in every year and so on. And there is, you can backdate it for three years and all of these things. But let's assume just for simplicity that I can just make that money today. Yeah. Okay. So what I will have to put in the SIP is 80% of that number only. And the government refunds the remaining 20%. Yeah, that you would have been taxed on and you're not taxed on it because it's gone in the SIP. Yeah. Exactly, but, but it yeah. comes in as cash. Sure. It comes into the SIP account as cash. So that's the right. rebate that you're getting from the government because it's a tax that you already paid that the government pays you back into your yeah. SIP. Because and if you're you want, on a higher rate, if you're on the next bracket, the 40%, they pay 40% back? Right, and no, 45 if it goes higher it's again? It's not always a straightforward. Okay. Um, you can... You can uh, but it's you certainly it's certainly return. free money, isn't it? That you, yeah, <laughs> you do a tax return and they can, uh, like, uh, they put your... They either give it to you as a tax refund or they can actually lower your uh, tax code so right. even though you're on a, a higher tax rate, you might end up paying the basic rate. Ah, even if you're right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. you've paid the money into a SIP. So yeah. th there are there are certain, but th that's a little bit more complicated and yeah, it yeah. needs a financial advisor actually to, to do that. <laughs> yeah. right? But yeah. I'm, I'm hoping like if, if you're earning that much money, you can you can get a financial advisor. To, to, to <laughs> Which will be for. deductible as well. Yes. <laughs> So, so actually, in order to achieve that four hundred and sixty-four thousand, what you need is the three hundred and seventy-one thousand two hundred pounds. Right. Right. So, so that's that's almost a third of the million pounds that we spoke yeah, about. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 But again, that's a big number. In order for you to achieve this over ten years, yeah. you will need to save thirty-eight thousand or thirty thirty-seven thousand pounds a year. Yeah, that's a lot of money. Even if, especially if you are earning something like thirty or forty thousand pounds a year. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that's that's not a very easy number to just save in a savings account or not. It has to be invested. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Again, and you can't touch it. Are, yeah. 
if you have a partner, this number is not on you alone. It can be divided among both of you. That's that's really the 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 benefit of not doing it alone. So each will have to come up with nineteen thousand pounds instead of thirty-seven thousand. Yes. Yeah. Again, it's it's a big number, but that's not how we're going to work it out. So let's let's go back to the original figure of four hundred and sixty-four thousand pounds, and that's that's where we're starting. Yeah. Well, I would do. Do we have time? Can I go through? Sure. Yeah. 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 Okay. So I'll I'll go to a free website I use. It's called the calculator site dot com. Right. Okay. And on there I can choose the where the savings goals. Okay. Um, and let's have a look at this savings goals. So. Over here, th there is a calculator. Can I share my screen with you? Yes, do it, please. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's try if I can. Um, yeah, there it is. Share this one. Share. Okay, so you can see this screen now. No, I don't see it. I still see you. I still see um, you. I don't know how that works. View tab. Let's try. Hmm. Well, it says share screen or stop we're, sharing. We're, st we're still getting you. <laughs> okay. Maybe maybe you could explain it to us and, and okay, I'll what's, explain what's the name of the website? Because later, if someone's watching this, they might go on and put and have a look themselves. Yes. What's the name of the it website first? Thecalculatorsite dot com. The calculator side .com. Okay. And then, and then if you and explain it now, so that for, when they go on, it might make more sense. Yeah. So what I looked for is I went to, like, there is a drop down menu under finance. Mm -hmm. And on the right, there is savings goals. Okay. Yeah. And over here, there is, okay, I'm choosing sterling for the currency. And what I will assume, I will assume that today I have a balance of zero in my pension account mm -hmm. and my goal is 464,000 pounds and I will be okay so 0 464,000 and the number of years is 10 years and over here in the annual interest rate so th this is where this is a very important part okay so we are going to be making investments in in that grow over time. Okay, and we're not talking about when we're talking about investments, we are usually talking about 10 to 12% per year, not 70 or 80% or 100% or cryptocurrencies or any of this rubbish. Okay, <laughs> right. please, please, I beg anyone who's listening to this, please, I beg you for <laughs> with anything that is dear to you, do not listen to anyone who's going to say that you can make all of this money in a year or a month or any of this rubbish, because this is just not going to happen. You're going to lose your money, your family's money. It's not going to happen. Okay. You can do this on the side. If you have spare cash, that is after you are paying your monthly things into the pension account and the ISA and all of these things, after all of that, if you have spare cash that you don't want to go and, and spend it on a meal, maybe buy some cryptocurrency or the next trade of whatever is going to be shooting up to the moon, right? But this is not what we're talking about. If yeah. you want to secure your future and your family's future, you invest in things that are actually investable and not just any rubbish okay so what we're going to do is we invest it into s p 500 or maybe uh, and maybe we can add to this the nasdaq 100 if we have over 15 years because the the issue is with these investments is that they're volatile right so you can have maybe two three years that the investment is is negative right and while the investment is going down remember that you are buying every month so you are improving your average entry price 
Okay, this is not just that you're putting money one time and you're leaving it and you're sleeping. This is contributing mm -hmm. into this every single month. Yeah. Automatically with a direct debit that comes out of your account, it goes into this account and you're, you're buying this investment every single month. So the, the NASDAQ 100, which is the uh, growth companies in the US, okay, this is normally it has a much higher return over a long period, but it's very volatile. Mm -hmm. So if you think about the uh, dot-com crash, the uh, any of these like big crashes that happened, the subprime usually crash, first... yeah. yeah. No, the subprime was slightly different. I'm okay. talking about the NASDAQ 100 was tech. Right. It, and it's very tech heavy. So tech, biotech, all of these things are in the NASDAQ 100. So it's very volatile because technology changes. They, there, there is always uh, people who are looking into the technology's future and not the present day. So there are a lot of companies that are not profit making. And then maybe when there is an economic downturn, these are getting out of favor and, and they are being sold off. So it is very volatile, but over the period of 30 years or 20 years, you can have a massive, massive average return of 17 to 20%. But you had periods of a decline of 80% at some wow. point. Wow. So if you have a short period of time, you cannot afford having this sort of drop. Right. Yeah. But over a longer period, you have the luxury of not caring if it goes down 60 70 percent because you're buying more and then over the years it's going to rebound and then when the rebound happens it rebounds a hundred percent 200 percent in right. in a couple of years that makes up for all of the decline that happened before so this way on average you get that 17 to 20 percent so it is very volatile but if i have time like 15 years or more i would put some of the money into an NASDAQ 100 fund in addition to an S&P 500 fund. The S&P 500, we're talking an average of about 10% to be on the conservative side. Again, yeah. it has periods like when you said, like the, the financial crisis, the, 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 um, the subprime mortgages, all of these things. When the market is, is negative, there is negative sentiment in the market, the markets come down. There is a, a period of two, three years where the markets are, are in the red, but then they rebound when things happen and and they just recover from, from that decline. So over a longer period of time, we're talking 10 to 12%. So let's just assume that our investments on average are going to return 10% per year until that point of retirement. Right. Because again, I can invest now in like because if if i have today 15 years i can invest in more volatile investments that have bigger returns over the long term and the closer i get to retirement i start to take out my investment in the volatile investments into more like the less volatile or more secure investments yeah okay so yeah. we'll we'll just call it 10% over the coming 10 years. So 10% per year as a return, okay? Yeah. So to achieve the 464,000 pounds, we need 2,265 pounds a month. Yeah. Okay, if yeah. you and your partner, so each of you are going to be paying 1,100 pounds, but that's not it yet, because right. this is before the tax rebate that you're getting from the government. Right. So you're only paying 80% of that number. Yeah. So what you want to actually be paying is 2265.13 times 0.8. You're paying 1,812 pounds a month. Okay, between so, the two of you. Yeah. Between the two of you. So each of you would have to pay about 900 pounds or 906 pounds. Mm -hmm. okay. It's a big number, but it's not massively out but there. but some people right now watching this they may be paying around 900 pounds to service of this existing debt yes you know yes. they they may have a payment of around you know around about that amount whether you know on whatever it is personal loan credit card car loan what have you and if they could get that under control then they that will they will free that up for that kind Absolutely. of investment 
Absolutely. So, so this is why it's it's extremely important to just work it out. Like when when one has the time and the luxury of just sitting down comfortably and working it out without the emotion, it becomes a little clearer. You know, like. Okay, now I, I, instead of thinking I need a million pounds, <laughs> yeah. Now I need to save nine hundred pounds from me and nine hundred pounds from my partner every month. Yeah. That's yeah. a very big difference, and yeah. I only have ten years. Yeah, yeah. Right, and yeah. Obviously, if I have more time, like if I if I have fifteen or twenty years, that that number is going to be very different. Yeah, yeah. It's going to yeah. be much much lower. Yeah, yeah. And this is why, like the, the 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 way to work it out is is important. The, the, this is this is why it has to happen all at the same time, simultaneously, yeah. right? Yeah. So the minimum payments on debt are very, yeah. That 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 shouldn't be something that one does. We have to start making payments that actually pay back the debt. Yeah. Or. Again, like I'll go back to something that I I was going to mention in the beginning that I skipped, which was in order, to, one has to have very good discipline, very good discipline, in that you can get a consolidation loan yeah. with a lower interest rate to consolidate all your debts into one loan with a low yeah. interest rate. Yeah, pay off the credit cards. The credit card with thirty percent, or even like the Amex, uh, the BA Black Amex, it's one hundred and eighteen percent a year. It's insane. So, and and it's it's accumulating every month, right? So it's you you just pay off all of these and forget about these cards. Don't ever use them again. Don't use credit cards at all. Well, th th this is where the discipline comes in because. You you can get benefits from credit cards like the BA uh, credit card. You get points on your BA, especially if you travel a lot. That that becomes very useful in booking hotels or or upgrading flights or all of these things. Um, you can you can also get a cash back from certain credit cards. Uh, you can if you're traveling again, certain credit cards you have uh, like zero percent uh, exchange on them. Like you don't have to pay commission on mm. uh, on exchange if you're traveling abroad. But you have to not use it as a credit card, but use pay it. Pay it off when the bill card. comes in each month. Pay it each exactly. month. If you so, if you are going to have it, use it for the advantages of it and pay it off. But never exactly. ever get to the point where you're just servicing the debt. Exactly. But a starting point that that the, the starting point has to be like if if you have all of these different credit cards and everything, if your credit score can allow you to get a consolidation loan for a lower interest rate to pay off all these debts and you only have one payment going out every month to that loan yeah. and forgetting about all of these things. So maybe the loan is like, I don't know, 15,000 pounds over three years. Right. Yeah. And this would probably be like something you might be paying something like 700, 800 pounds a month. Mm -hmm. to to just get rid of all your you you've already got rid of the credit cards because you paid them off from the consolidation loan mm -hmm. and you only have that one payment of the 7 or 800 pounds a month plus the 900 pounds a month that you have to pay into your pension account yeah so yeah. that's already a big number yeah. okay but these have to take priority over everything else for me it takes priority over eating drinking anything Right. And for because, some people, because we are talking about latecomers, particularly yeah. people maybe in their 50s, they may have paid off their mortgage. So they may have some, that may have, you know, without, you know, going silly or, and over, you know, they, they may have already got to that point. Or they might be in a done. situation like mine where I am still not paid off. I, I still had to restart from the beginning and buy a shared ownership and then move it up and all of these things. So it is still there is something that, that has to go out on housing every month. Yeah. But even yeah. then, like, it, th there are two things if you're in your 40s and 50s. First of all, it's likely that you have kids that need money. Right. But the other thing on the flip side is it is also likely that your salary is high enough that you can afford to 
actually when you sit down and cut down on certain things you can afford to pay these yes yes yeah unless you are on on a very very low salary very like the the, the it's 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 that that becomes a little bit more difficult and then i talk a little bit about maybe one of the main things that i found were useful is talking to the credit card company or the bank or whatever yeah and tell them i want to pay this back but i don't want to be accumulating the interest right what can we do yeah now here we have to be careful because if you go into voluntary uh, uh, arrangement with the bank and it, and it goes on your credit report that's that's a big problem okay so as long as it won't affect your credit score yeah if that agreement with them at least to freeze the accumulation of the interest that would be a good starting point yeah yeah tell them that i want to pay it off but with the interest that you're charging me i cannot afford this please help me yeah but make sure that you're not going to ask them if any of the suggestions that they make to you because they're always going to make suggestions as to how to do this if yeah. any of the suggestions is going to affect your credit score think about it a hundred times because that's that's going to be a big problem for you to do anything in the future whether it's mortgage uh getting the consolidation loan even maybe the consolidation loan would be a better way of of dealing with this yeah. maybe your employer if you go and talk to your employer about a loan that they can take immediately from your paycheck every month that could be another way of doing it as well yeah. sometimes that can be a little bit yeah sensitive but yeah. it is something that can be done yeah yeah so there are I ways as long as you focus on it as well. yeah but but it has to be addressed and it has to be addressed with those who are providing the debt as well yeah. as the family and and this is really key yeah. because then as soon as this is addressed and you know exactly how much you're going to be paying every month and how long it's going to take you until you get rid of that debt until that point you're always going to be wondering whether you're ever going to pay off that debt but yeah. that's the first point is just make sure that it's clear how long it's going to take you how much is going to be taking from you every month yeah. go through the budget go through all the items that are outgoing every month and make sure that you make cuts where cuts can be made yeah yeah, yeah. sometimes it can even be downsizing your house yes that that's probably a very big problem that people might have but it could be if this is the only solution it has to be done but it might be a case once again of empty nesters you know where the kids are yeah. now you know on their way and you don't need a four bedroom house anymore two bedroom house would do fine and yeah, yeah so you could end up with that too yeah, yeah. or you could move to a different area where you could get a exactly. similar house you know, houses are much cheaper in the north <laughs> you know? exactly so the, again like the, the the area where that we live in might be too expensive if i go just 10 miles down the road it's just like a third of the price it's it's like the price differences can be massive and yeah. it's only two stops on on a train yeah so it's it's not like it, yes it might be inconvenient and all of that but remember that we are in a situation where drastic measures have to be taken because you're running and out of time exactly this yeah. is this is very different from a 20 year old now that we're not yes. 20 or 30 anymore we're that's very why this is such an important book you yeah. know you know for you know latecomers guide to financial freedom it, it's uh it's almost like the last chance saloon, isn't it? You know, it's. Uh, I know you probably didn't want to have a a a, a, t a a very dramatic title like that because, you know, that's 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 not how it is. But uh, yeah, it's uh, it's a very very important I don't want book. It to be the final solution, either. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, well, it's a terrific book. How did you, as, with this being the second uh, audio book that we've done together, how did you find the process this time? of turning the work into an audiobook. 
well, much easier because I knew you and I knew <laughs> <laughs> it, was, uh, it was just very straightforward. Yeah. Oh, that's that's great to know. That's good. Well, we could talk for a long, long time about this, but I think if you want more information, and really, if you're in your 40s and 50s, you really need this information. Latecomer's Guide to Financial Freedom by Hassan Afifi. It's available as a Kindle book, it's available. Is it a paperback as well? As is, is yeah. it a physical book too? It's, yeah. it's a physical book too. And of course, it is an audio book. Whichever is the easiest way for you to get the information, get it. It's the Latecomer's Guide to Financial Freedom. Hassan Afifi, once again, thank you very much for your time. Well, thank you very much, Grant.